first of all, the, the, don't you think that it's pretty realistic? And this is the first iteration of the technology, right? I, imagine in six months or 12 months, all of us could have a version of this. If you continue watching the video, Reed will tell you, I don't do anything special. I used off-the-shelf solutions. So basically, all of you can do this. He had a lot more social presence, so uh, the AI could train on a lot of public statements, keynotes, classes, books. He's been all over uh, the news over the last two decades, and so there's a lot of information to train from, which maybe we don't have as much at this point. But he mentions on the video all of the tools that he's used to create this avatar, his clone. I believe so. I believe that it's been able to train a lot more, given the just amazing amount of volume of data that he has on the web, on the internet, publicly available. I'm sure he also fed him and played more with it. So any of these tools take a few iterations and quite a lot of training to get perfect, but it's pretty good. And this could be just the first, uh, you know, like fun expression manifestation of something fu uh, gimmicky, as something that is talked about. But the relevant information here, if we go back one slide, please. Oh yeah, I can do this myself. Is there any way to not make this so, can I just hold it? It's very, very. Hello, this is better, right? Okay, so there are already products like that um, logo that I show you current, which have fully autonomous workers working, taking jobs that are ones for human roles. In this case, current can create a team of AIs. This concept of we're going to be using AI as our assistant is no longer true. In the case of current, they can have three, four, five people, AIs, uh, working with each other, each one of them having different supervision roles. So they apply this in the context of customer service. You know, when you have the customer service agent, the first frontline worker who responds to common inquiries, and then you would have a supervisor who takes care of the more complicated cases, or if one of the clients asks for somebody who's a manager or a supervisor, they will pass you on to somebody with more experience, right? Well, they have that process already built in for different AIs. So some AIs can be curators, editors, supervisors, managers, and others just problem solve the most uh, basic inquiries. And so if you imagine this in the future, we're going to have a situation where many of your employees are going to be working side by side with fully autonomous AIs. And this is already there. It's, we don't have to reach AGI to be able to have some of these co-workers cohabitating with us who are fully AI machines. So this is more of a pop quiz so that we make sure everybody knows. Who can explain to me what AI is? What is AI? Artificial intelligence. I saw you raising your hands. So I'm going to be a teacher and actually make you accountable. The ones who raised your hand and you said you know five. <laughs> Artificial intelligence. What is AI? Is this new? Yes, what is AI? Amazing. One thing that's really interesting about, you know, when there's a pop quiz and when you ask questions, uh, all my students become super powered uh, superheroes, like Wonder Woman, and I'm like, everybody just acquired the superhero superpower of invisibility. You know? It's really, it happens every time for some reason. Um, AI is not just generation of new content. It's one of the things that you mentioned. But artificial intelligence has existed for decades. 
And it's basically very, if I reduce it to a very simple um, explanation, is taking a lot of data, finding patterns from that data, and creating models that a lot of times have predictive power because those patterns tend to repeat themselves. And so humans do this, right? If I, every time I uh, shake hands with somebody uh, who, I don't know, smells really great because they're wearing good perfume, maybe they have good taste, right? Like that's, maybe that's a pattern that I find as a human. And then I develop algorithms uh, that are based on those patterns and observations to predict what's going to happen next. Another example, the climate, right? If you uh, look at data for 100 years on the uh, weather, let's say in California in March, I will probably be able to refine that model to eventually have a pretty precise 10-day window. And now with AI having improved maybe even much more precise than that, uh, on, for example, March 7, 2025, what the temperature and the weather conditions will be. So that's AI. It's not new. But in 2021, in November, what did we have? What happened? Yes, who said ChatGPT? Don't be shy. Say it louder. <laughs> A plus, right? Um, so ChatGPT was launched. The actual application, uh, technological application, with the fastest adoption on record in human history. 100 million people use ChatGPT within six weeks of being launched the technology. So this means that at that point, AI acquired the ability to generate its own content. That's why it's generative AI. It's using all of the information and how humans use language to communicate with each other to be able to now create its own set of combinations, permutations of those words, grammar, to create what sounds like a human-generated speech or statement. And that was not easy to get to. So once we had this ability to interact with uh, machines, with language that was human-like, that was really revolutionary. And that's what generative AI was. Question? Or, ah, OK. Um, now, what is the other stuff that we are hearing a lot about? LLMs and machine learning. Who can explain LLMs? Yes. Sure, machine learning. Yes. Yes, it's, it's iteration. It's feedback loops. It's my children coming and saying, Mom, can I have a candy? No. Mom, can I have a candy, please? No. Mom, can I have a candy? Please, I love you so much. Yes, right? So that's machine learning. They learn all the time. They try and try, and then different uh, applications uh, of, yes, the trials will feed them information that will improve the model. Yes. Absolutely. So it's, it's an ingredient that made ChatGPT and generative AI possible. But I mentioned machine learning because right now, as we speak, all of the AIs that are out there, you know, these um, many applications that we see are training. And in fact, by 2030, it is estimated that it will, AI in general will run out of material to train because the speed at which it's doing it, it's 15 trillion data points. Uh, I think a month. Is it a month or a year? Either way, it will run out of information to even train on. And can I tell you what is really... But, but to clarify something, it is a different architecture. Yes. It is, they are both machine learning and large language models are based on neural networks. Their architecture is different. Large language models are based on the TensorFlow architecture, which is, it, it is different. So what's beautiful about this is it's like a child. You know, you release this toddler, it's learning, it's trying the world, and it's improving its understanding of the world. And I'll tell you the one thing that actually this was true. I went to uh, a meeting where they explained why we're developing, let's say Sora, for example, right? It's not just to have a quick way of making videos, which is the application that we see today that is fun. 
but it's because once AI right now can consume information that is text and images. With Sora, AI will be able to consume information that's 3D video. So imagine what happens if artificial intelligence can learn and read and process information on every security camera that has recorded information, every Zoom video, every movie, every documentary. There's a lot more data on how humans move, interact, react, than just speech. And that's kind of scary to me. I didn't want to say, he said it, <laughs> but it is Terminator, right? And so we're getting pretty close. Okay, so OpenAI just announced that we're in stage two almost. There are five stages. The first stage is just what we have right now, the conversational skill with a human-like machine. Number two is uh, the ability by AI to reason like a PhD level human being. So cognitive capacity of logic and reasoning of a doctoral degree uh, without any special tools, right? Without any amplification. And then five would be AGI, which is a general intelligence, artificial general intelligence, and that's Terminator, potentially. Hopefully, you know, it will look like a panda bear and it will be non-threatening, but it is, it is going to be that level of cognitive ability. And the language models are, of course, uh, this, uh, the, yes. Data. Yes. Yeah, there are a lot of these um, you know, assumptions and predictions are based on data that is created by humans that is training on, but this is so static. You know our brains change when we interact with technology? This was actually proven by uh, John Haidt, a professor at NYU, who wrote a book called, it was published this year, The Anxious Generation. And it showed that in 2010, with all of social media being used by teenagers, especially female teenagers, their brains actually started to change anatomically. The wiring of your brain changes. And in fact, it created a lot of bad effects. Uh, anxiety, depression, self-mutilation increased to almost a threefold increase in many of these um, studied control groups. So if, you, if we're using this today, in two or three years, our reactions could also change, just like my students do not interact with each other the way we used to interact with each other. Do you, any of you find it really odd that people will send you a million audio messages, voice messages, but they will never pick up the phone? Okay, so that is a behavior change because of technology. My students, if I call them, they're like, what's happening? Who called me? Who died? Right? It's just the simultaneous interaction with a human is overwhelming. And when they tell them to interact with each other, to network in my classroom, the generation that's 20 today, it, this, this was the one example that blew my mind. So somebody found each other and they're always kind of like on the phone because if nobody's talking to them, they can always find refuge on their phone. They're not rejected, they have their phone, right? So like they're interacting, but they're kind of like on the phone and two people found themselves to be a match and so one of them goes, all right, give me your phone number so I can you know, call you to get together and work on this project. And the person goes, okay, my phone number is, and then looks into his phone <laughs> and looks for the phone. And I'm like, you have to know one phone number. Probably your lawyer, because you're Stanford students, you'll probably go to jail someday. <laughs> um, question over there? Yes. That is, 
that is a, a value system which I would love all of us as a human species to discuss and decide intentionally and not, not that it's imposed upon us like it has happened with other technologies. Because right now we feel like there's no choice, but you are giving every piece of information you give to AI is an opportunity for AI to understand how to help you better, but also how to manipulate you better. Same thing with my children. They learn both things, how to help me and how to manipulate me. Right now they're focused on manipulation, but <laughs> hopefully someday the help will come. Yes. Yes. Yes, so the regulation um, and institutional safeguards and guardrails that we have to develop, it's in, in discussion right now. But as I said, you know, every two weeks we have some new development. We in Silicon Valley, the technologists and VCs are having a hard time keeping up. Imagine somebody in DC or in your local Congress, uh, there is so much ignorance and what these technologies can do, will do, are doing, uh, that I don't think we can rely on institutional, legal uh, rulings for us to be protected. It has to be, again, a culture thing, where we decide we prefer to be outside playing instead of YouTube, for example, right? But, you know, a lot of retail companies, for those of you, I know Puerto Rico retail is really strong, uh, most of the big retail uh, brands in the world are now working in understanding the customer to a point that you don't have to order anymore, right? The point of interaction with a brand is not me saying, I need to buy a birthday gift for my son, so I'm gonna go to Amazon, for example. It's gonna be me talking to my AI assistant and saying, today I feel like um, lazy, you know, and I, I wanna do something nice for my kid. And it will start more emotionally about just sharing something that I'm feeling. That will evolve with a bot. Imagine Alfred and Batman, right? And saying, hey, have you thought about um, your, your son's birthday? Birthdays are happy times for your children. Um, I already ordered something so that you know, they have a really big gift and special gift for this year. That, coupled with your son actually talking to AI and AI knowing every secret, every dream, every aspiration, every vulnerability and insecurity your son will have. That part is really scary to me. Oh, yes, yes. Yes, and we will cover some of those biases and how the biases could get worse, or we could use AI to solve some of those biases. Um, but the truth is, it comes down to our intention. And this is where I think we're failing right now. We're so super excited about this new shiny thing, which is AI, and we're trying to play with it and interact with it without really stating, wait a minute, first, Think of a puppy. When you bring a puppy home, you're super excited, right? You want to play with this puppy all the time. It's really fun. And then at some point you have to say, I'm going to train this puppy not to eat off the table, like ever. If you have pets, you know that's really difficult. And you only have a window of time to do that. By the time the, the dog is four years old, 
done, you're done. There's nothing you can do. It will eat off your table. So right now, AI is a puppy. We have a little window to say, wait, I want you to eat off the table. But next year, two years from now, it's too late. So right now, I want all of us in every organization to say, what do you want this puppy to do? And that's your choice. But it has to be explicit, and it has to be now. Yeah. So just to give you a framework on what AI is building towards, is it started off as an assistant, an, an Alfred, right? Somebody who says, I want you to go and fetch me something. I want you to go and research for me so that I can save time. That, that part is done. One has been tested. We have a lot of, I mean, too many assistants and bots AI-based these days to even count. Number two is the amplification. I don't know why this slide is in Spanish, sorry. <laughs> AI must have done it. I'm gonna, <laughs> now everything is to blame to AI. Nothing works, and then you say, oh, AI didn't work. Um, so, now this actually happened to a friend of mine. Uh, she was renting a car, and there was a mix up with a reservation, and she, in kind of an old lady from Florida, she goes, I'm so sorry, honey, AI didn't show up today, and so we're struggling with our technology. <laughs> like she had no idea what AI was actually doing for the organization. So amplification is when you have a human and technology working together to improve your performance. Typical example here is doctor is diagnosing breast cancer together with AI, and to when they combine their skill sets, they have higher precision in diagnosing breast cancer. Individually, they're actually lower. So human, let's say it's 92%, let's make up AI to be 86, but together, they're 98%. So that's amplification, that with the use of this technology, you become like an X-Men, right? And with a mutation that makes you more powerful. And then autonomous, is what we, I thought we had some time to get to, but it's already, I see some examples, early examples of autonomous workers already. What's really relevant about um, what's happening in the evolution of technology, initially when we had the birth of PCs and internet, we were only able to communicate with it, with a machine, with very specific commands. The, these were words and commands that you had to learn, um, and that limited our interaction and the output that we got from uh, the machine. Then we had these icons, right, with Windows especially, and then with uh, Apple machines, where just very easily, with the press of certain buttons, or just, uh, you know, sliding uh, images you could communicate with a machine. And now, it's the first time that we can communicate with a machine uh, like we are almost peers. So again, let's go back to the example of the baby. The first thing you can do with babies is communicate with sign language, single words, very uh, you know, broken, the communication we can, we can kind of understand, but not really. The toddler, you know, simple phrases. Then you have a teenager, who speaks like you and, and probably sounds exactly like an adult, but not quite sophisticated yet. You know, they still laugh at fart jokes and they still have things that make you feel they're not quite to the maturity level that you know, adult humans are. So AI is also in the same way. I think right now it's a teenager. It can emote, it can express compassion, even empathy. It can give you the range of human reactions that you uh, prompt AI to do for you, but it's still kind of dramatic and not, uh, you know, sophisticated the way I would call an adult, mature human being, emotional range. But we'll get there. The way human brains and AI are different, do you, anybody knows the answer to this? Is AI exactly the same as the human brain, just more powerful? No, so in which ways is it different? Who can dare to, to risk an answer? What's that? It's not intuitive. What else? Yeah, what I'm hearing from you is that it's not always predictable. Humans are not exactly the same. My favorite example of that is um, a quote from 
Pamela Anderson, who on her documentary on Netflix, she said, you know, I keep getting married, fall in love, uh, divorce. Then I fall in love again, get married, and divorce. And I do this like eight times. What's wrong with me, she said. And then she goes, wait, that imperfection is probably what people really love about me. I'm really human. And that is what is actually very different from humans. Um, I have to, again, use a soccer a metaphor. Escaloni, who's the DT, uh, the coach for Argentina, said to win World Cups or Copa Americas, you have to have three things. One, the Messi's and the Fideos, you know, like the best players, the Dibu Martinez, who are high performers, and they have to be able to reliably, consistently perform well in every one of the matches. Number two, you have to have some new players, your fresh blood, you know, new methodologies, new things, that, new ideas that are coming into the table, so not just a status quo, some innovation. And then you see the third ingredient, which is the most important one, is the unpredictable. That something crazy happens. And when something crazy happens, like, you know, we had a goalkeeper who consistently blocked penalties. Like, that's not expected. When you have unexpected things is when you win World Cups. The unexpected usually comes from humans. Because when Van Gogh wakes up one day and says, I wonder what happens if the horizon is higher up and I use colors that are not in nature. Like that kind of, I wonder, comes from humans. AI doesn't really do that breakthrough that deviates from the norm. It usually tries to stick within the norm that it reads and trains from. And so that unpredictability is not human, that's true. What George, uh, Jeffrey, sorry, Hinton said, who was one of the fathers of AI, he quit in May 2022 for ethical reasons. He said, I can't continue condoning what's happening because I know too much. I built this technology and I'm uncomfortable where, where it's going. He described in his reasons to leave Google, the reason, the, the explanation of why humans and machines are different. The original intent was to make AI emulate, resemble human brains. But in the process, he discovered that there are some very important differences. A, we will never beat uh, machines in its capacity to c compute and process information. We already lost that battle, right? We, computers can process millions, trillions of data points. We can do that. We can maybe get to millions or billions. The second thing is that if you have a bunch of machines learning about something together, the information transfer is instantaneous. But let's say we are researching something together. It takes a lot of time. Like It's taking me hours to give you a few concepts that I know. So we are slow in communication. But the third difference that is really, really important is that for us to agree to do something, what do we need? Consensus? How do you get consensus? Hmm? A vote, so you have to express your intent. What else? Yes? Do I work with anybody or do I have to have connection? And the connection builds what? Trust. trust. There you go. So trust is actually a very important safety valve. Because if I just show up here today and I say, Let's go and destroy you know, a building. Are you going to say yes? No, hopefully not, right? You're going to say no, that's not right. I dissent. I have a different perspective. That process of trust building is what actually makes us not do dumb things all the time. Sometimes we do. But it happened in Miami, in <laughs> the Copa Finals. But um, for the most part, that is a really good safety valve. That judgment is not native to AI. So now we have very powerful computers who, which can process information extremely fast, communicate the lessons learned pretty much instantaneously without the third human component of trust, judgment, prioritization, value system that is going to ensure that AI is going to be focused on the right things. Are good. 
So it now informs me what is good and what is bad. We're going to getting really philosophical here, <laughs> but it's a very good question because it, I can bring it back to family business. It comes down to value systems. So why organizations owned by families act in a certain way usually goes back to this is our history, this is what we believe in, this is our purpose as a family, right? And that we have as humans, institutions change. You know, women in Korea did not have the same rights when my parents were raised there as we have now, um, and that's evolution of institutions. But those changes happen slowly with a lot of consensus building, a lot of trust building, a lot of activism, whereas with machines you don't need that process, and that's dangerous. I will answer with an example. Europe is more closed and protective, which is usually the tradition in Europe, which in principle is good. But for the talent pool, it's like you guys are riding these carriages, perfectly well-run fed horses, and then Ford is building manufacturing plants in the US. And now Europe says cars will not enter Europe, at least for 10 years. Fine, maybe you're happy with your horses, right? But what happens with the talent? Uh, who's going to build a Ferrari? The ones who experienced working in a factory at Ford or the ones who have been occupied perfecting the carriage? And that's, that's the risk of not participating. Yeah, but it's 50% in the US, it's $200 billion. It's, the, the sizes are very different, right? That makes a huge difference at the end of the day, what gets actually implemented and adopted. Six months will make a huge difference. And that's the opportunity for all of us here in Puerto Rico, in Latin America, in the global south, because we do have a little more wiggle room, which again, could be dangerous, but if, we, if, we, if it's used well, we could have the first instances of case studies and success cases that are going to train talent. Now think about this. If you want to tell your children, your employees, your family members to study something that may or may not get a job or study something that will most likely give them a $500,000 initial salary, what are you going to tell them, right? Go freaking work on that factory and learn how to earn $500,000. And that's AI right now. So you got to get involved. All right. So given these differences, the most important thing for any organization is what? <laughs> you know, value system. <laughs> money. Money is the most important. No, no. <laughs> Value system, the opposite. Um, it's really about the value system. It's the culture. It's the intention that we want for the, our family businesses. When you start with that, then AI can be used for good. And talking about good and bad, and being bad because I'm taking away time from Armando. I'll try to wrap it up pretty soon. Good questions, though. So, um, All right. Let's go to the biases question I think you, you asked over there. Another story that I'll tell you is um, that the use of technology is really tricky when you can monitor a lot of things. Already, you probably have some cases when Zoom calls, your meetings virtually are being recorded and transcribed automatically. That also records other things, right? Eventually, it can record your sentiment. It can record patterns. Maybe every time Armando in a meeting says, I don't know, means that the decision is not going to be made, right, at the end of the day. It could be that somebody not smiling a lot on a certain day could translate into uh, lack of implementation on a certain project. Those patterns that we in many of our board meetings and meetings kind of intuitively have built over time, AI can do precisely, can find predictive patterns in a lot of interactions between humans and in meetings. Now, um, Colocini, Fabrizio is a soccer player. He was uh, Messi's mentor when Messi joined the national team in Argentina. 
an excellent player. He went and in, ended his career in Newcastle, where by the end of his career, he's, he was being monitored uh, with sensors and chips on his shoes every move he had at the game, right? So by the end of any match, he would be told your velocity, how much you run, your speed, well, everything. One day, he tells me, Rebecca, I, towards the end of my career, I had the best game of my life. I felt great. I felt like I was going to end in my terms, my best physical shape, and I was a great player and contributor to that match. I go and run towards my coach, and I'm like, hey, did you see? Like, I was amazing, right? And the coach was on his iPad and goes, what happened to you today? Are you getting old? Are you injured? And Fabrizio couldn't believe it. Went home, rewatched the game, and no, he says, Rebecca, like I, every pass, every center, every contribution was perfect. So he went back to the coach and said, I, I just don't understand why you thought I didn't have a good performance. And he said, well, your average speed and the amount of um, running you did in the game was much, much lower than your average and definitely lower than the other younger players in the team. So what is the lesson here? What happens when you m measure things? Mm -hmm. OK, let's keep going. OK, different conditions. What you, you're measuring is um, not fair. Mm -hmm. Precision, you can measure, it's more precise, but then? Yes, yes. Yes, exactly, exactly. What's that? It's going to affect your behavior. Right. It could happen that somebody tells and says, for the last month, you smiled 50% less in meetings. You must be going through mental health issues. <laughs> right? It could, it could tell you that. Right, right, exactly. What you measure becomes reality. And when you have the ability to measure all the time and everything, then that's dangerous, unless you plan and design this really well. So Colocini played well but he was being measured by a different metric that was not looking at beautiful soccer, it was m looking at anatomical differences on velocity of the human body, and that's not soccer. Because we all know Messi doesn't run. He still plays soccer, but he hasn't run in 10, 10 years, probably. <laughs> yes, I didn't say that officially. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, goodness, this is AI and it's, Yes, go ahead. What happens if AI works against you? Because I've heard of an instance where a lawyer used AI to litigate a case and the information was bad information. Hallucinations. Yes. From AI. Yes. So that's happening with Google, you know, like it gives you now the summary of all of the, you never go to the original link anymore because it already summarizes. Now WhatsApp has the AI feature already integrated to WhatsApp. So this means that everything we hear is kind of the, do you, anybody know what Plato's cave allegory is? Who can tell me? Show me your hum humanities background. you will have second-hand knowledge, right? Because you're just seeing the shadows of the reality, you never get out. So AI is doing that to us right now. We're not getting out. <laughs> she probably went to Harvard, not MIT. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so this is the, the reality that we are facing right now. Information is not reliable the way my generation went to the library. We pulled out an encyclopedia. There are physical pages. It's there, it's the truth. It's not there, it's not the truth, right? Today, my kids don't have that. They already question everything I say. And they go and, and check TikTok, 
uh, they ask AI, of course, uh, but also Google uh, and, and YouTube, and then they have to make sense of that. They have to make sense of four, five, six sources of reality, and then triangulate and come up with their own reality. The truth? I don't think so. I, th I think we're winging it. <laughs> In Silicon Valley, it's always been the case. Let's break it and fix it later. This time, I think that's a huge mistake. In the past, I was more on the side of, you know, ask for forgiveness. Just do it. Don't ask for permission. But now I think that's a huge mistake. But I don't think people are thinking about Plan B. People are thinking about what next, what next, you know? What else can the puppy do? Oh, I can do tricks. Amazing. Now let's teach another trick without thinking by, you know, a year or two, it will be doing, it will be eating my pillows. And it's too late to teach it. All right. So the, what we're going to talk to Alfredo about at the end of today's session is the role of the generations in the families. So we'll bring it back to families with Armando, who's going to provide a lot of case studies about how some of these technologies are applicable not for just generation of videos, but for manufacturing, for supply chains, for logistics, for information integration within departments in uh, traditional businesses. So you'll get much more practical knowledge with Armando on how it applies to family businesses. But then we're going to talk about governance and intergenerational dynamics and how these present some opportunities and some challenges when it comes to adoption of technology in general, and especially AI. We, with Thunderbird School of Global Management, actually run a session on family business and AI in um, LA earlier this year. And the whole focus was all the people on that stage were members of families who were bringing the AI perspective, AI ideas, AI technologies into their family businesses. They were all in their 20s. This is the generation who gets it, who are excited about it, who can contribute at least to uh, your family businesses, but they have to be empowered. And that's what we're going to be discussing later today. So I think this is the last one. Let me just double check. Okay. Yeah, there you go. So a few general pieces of advice to wrap it up. I think my main message for today is value systems and culture. The values determine what consumers buy. The values determine what organizations decide. The values will make us different from machines. And so the most important thing for you as a family business to do is to have introspection and a very open dialogue on what are those value systems that rule your organization. And we'll go into more, because I'm afraid I an expert on this and, and culture in organizations. Um, we will talk very specifically about how to create early successes, uh, but also protect uh, those who are experimenting and risking to take some of the, the risk in the early failures. And that's going to be part of our conversation later with Alfredo. I'll end with uh, another play of words, which I love to do. Um, as organizations, everybody's wondering right now, how can we survive the AI era? And uh, I, I was thinking, I obsess about words sometimes. And, you know, when originally uh, survive, the word that comes from Latin came about, it, it was based on supravivere. So in Latin, it's overliving or living uh, over the expectations. So it was actually over outperforming the expected lifespan of humans. And that was sobrevivir, to do really, really well, to thrive. And somehow, at some point in history, survive changed into barely living, you know, barely making it. 
And so when it comes to your family business and AI, I challenge you to do that reversal. Instead of just thinking about how do I survive, let's think about how you can go to the original meaning of the word, which is to take this opportunity to outperform your wildest dreams and aspirations as an organization. And whenever there is a pivotal point, a shift, one of these you know, um, breakthroughs around you, that's a great opportunity to reposition yourself and potentially, uh, if you don't already have a leadership position, to secure a leadership position in your, in your market or industry. So with that, I, I want to introduce you to Armando. Thank you so much for your attention. All the time we have, thank you, Rando. Now, um, I'm told we have to take a bio break. It's, um, we have to uh, let you have a little bit of a break so you can go and go to the bathroom, etc. But let's bring it back to ten, in 10 minutes, because we're already late. 10 minutes, go to the bathroom, grab a, a drink or coffee, come back, please, as soon as you can. Sorry, Armando. <laughs> Otherwise, we, we don't follow regulations. Being the pharmaceutical business is exactly like playing darts. Right? You get a whole bunch of darts and you throw, and every once in a while you're going to hit a bullseye, but mostly you're going to miss. That's exactly what the pharmaceutical business is. So for a pharmaceutical company, they may have millions of compounds that are, that are potentials. Go try and test millions of compounds. Impossible, right? AI can give us like, well, these, there are millions of them, but these hundred, these look pretty good. So it, it radically, radically changes the economics, especially in life science, but in other areas as well, in material science, et cetera, et cetera, chemical engineering. The third one is probably the one that most companies are implementing, or the, the one that is being implemented the most, and that's the ability to be able to interact with customers, be it however you touch them, be it in sales, in marketing, or in customer support, how you touch a customer, you can suddenly be able to do it at a quality level and at a scale that otherwise is impossible. So a lot of the early success stories you hear are in this third category because it's total game changer in terms of the economics and the customer satisfaction that you can get out of it. So, uh, so I think I've kind of made this point. Why is this so important? Well, it's important for very simple reasons. In fact, I'm not even going to use this statistic. Uh, if anybody's interested, I'll send you this paper. PwC came out with a great paper recently that what they did is they did a very thorough analysis of every kind of industry. And then they, they said, if a company in that industry became AI at the core, how would it, that company change financially? Right? And they did it industry by industry. And it was anywhere from about an EBITDA improvement of anywhere from, oh, sorry, gross margin, gross margin improvement of anywhere from around 15% down to about 5%, depending on the industry that it sat in. Surprisingly, one of the very top ones, which is one I would not have guessed, luxury goods. And it wasn't, I looked into the paper a little bit because that, that didn't seem to, you know, Louis Vuitton, why would this improve Louis Vuitton so much? And I didn't think about it until I thought that AI can do a much better job at design than a human being can, because it can evaluate fashion trends in a way that a human being can, right? So as a result, for, and in fact, if you look into it further, there is no, there is no large scale manufacturer of clothing, apparel, that doesn't have a heavy duty implementations of AI going on right now. That's from Nike to Reebok, we're involved with, with New Balance. Uh, we've been involved with some of the Mexican shoe manufacturers, this Louis Vuitton, that's all the luxury brands, right? So your next purse, 
for the women here. Your next purse will probably be designed by AI, hopefully one of our AI guys. <laughs> Preferably one of our AI guys. Um, so, but you get the, the idea. You're, you're, you're going to wind up fundamentally changing the economics of business. And you'll have a dramatic improvement in the financial outcome of your own company as a result. So what does that mean? Well, that means is that if you're in a competitive market and all of a sudden you have a 40% boost in productivity among your workers, and that's throwing off 15, 20% improvement in gross margin and throwing down an extra 50% in EBITDA, guess what? You are a monster competitor. You're going to bury your competition by the same token, threat or opportunity. If you're one of the people who's going to be a laggard, you're going to be up against one of these AI at the core kind of companies. It's going to bury you, right? So that's where the fundamental kind of impetus is for business to implement these things sooner versus later. All right, so the first one, the first one is the innovation side of it. As I said, a lot of this is in life sciences. But, but even if you look at, you know, I already used the life sciences example, example with DeepMind, and this one has a, a bunch of other life sciences ones. Uh, by, in fact, the alpha fold one, you know, the 100 million proteins, two weeks, what, there's already a liver cancer cure that is in the market that directly came out of alpha fold. It's already in the market, right? So it's, it's happening at a pretty accelerated pace. You see a bunch of examples here, but um, I'll pick something that's not uh, pharmaceutical related. Um, aerospace. Go, go look up, I should have had like a picture of it here. Go look up the parts that AI is generating for aircraft, and they look something straight out of sci-fi movie. Right? They're organic in shape. They have all these weird con contortions. That part can have five to 10 times improvement in the torsional and the stretch strength of a normal human design part. A, a human, once again, correlations. Right, You cannot correlate data at the level to be able to design a simple a human being. Can't design a part at the level that, an, that a narrow AI agent can design that same part. So that's happening in all kinds of different industries. Again, life sciences being kind of the most obvious one. OK, let's skip that one. Personalization at scale. This is the one that, that I like the best because it's the one that's easiest to explain. And we're doing, a, we're doing a lot of these personalization at scale ideas. So I'm going to, the simplest way to describe what this one is is what I call the United Airlines two bump method. So I have some like two million miles on United Airlines, okay? That means I get a special phone number because I'm lifetime have some level of status with United. So I call up that phone number and what happens? I get on the phone, somebody typically in the Philippines that's making about $20 a day has been in the job about a month and I ask a complex question. There's no way that that person is going to be answered. So what happens? Can I speak to your manager? So you speak to the manager, and you're going to get somebody still in that office in the Philippines that now is getting paid $25 a day. That person's been there for six months, still not going to be able to answer the question. Could I speak to your manager? At that point, two, months, two bumps level later, you're going to talk to somebody that's probably been working for United for about 20 years. Typically, it's, it's an ex operations person or flight attendant or somebody like that, but they know how the company works. You ask that same question, it's like, oh, you asked a great question. They get excited. It's like, you gave me a complicated one. And they will nail that every time, right? Two bump method. Well, what I really want as a customer is I want the second bump the first time, right? And that's exactly what you get with AI. So what happens, in fact, the bet, one of our customers who's a, who's one of the biggest uh, transportation companies in Mexico. I love what he said. He said, look, we have a very simple model here. What we want to do is we want to provide American Express black level card service to every one of our millions of customers. Impossible to do with any other method than AI. There's no way you can provide, you can't provide the number of employees, you can provide the skill in those employees to provide that level of service, 
right? So there's a lot of case studies that are happening that's exactly this personalization at scale kind of idea. And if it, uh, I only gave, I just gave a B2C example. It's the same problem with B2B, right? You're a transportation logistics company, right? You're not, you're not selling to a consumer, right? You're selling to other companies who's so you're transporting their goods. But you still have a customer interaction, right? You still have to, that person on the other end of that relationship wants to know where their goods going to show up and they want to be able to answer, get an exact answer 24 hours a day from an expert of what's happening inside the company, right? Can't do that any other way. So in, in all cases, these kind of applications are kind of low-hanging fruit for AI. Uh, Klarna is, is a great example of this. And so uh, in an earlier talk, uh, Rebecca used the Klarna example because it became so visible. And I'm going to do a different spin on the way that Rebecca described it. The way that Rebecca described it is that what happened with Klarna is they're the biggest fintech startup in Europe. It's one of, you know, Europe is not exactly a startup central, right? So every once in a while, they get an SAP or something. They hold them up like, look at us. We came up with one, right? Klarna is one of those. The problem is that Klarna, what they do, for those of you not familiar with Klarna, what they do is that when you go to buy something, they give you an option to pay it over six months or 12 months. You just click on that button. That's typically that button is powered by Klarna, right? How that works for economically, God, God only knows how that works. But basically, it's free payments over an extended period. So uh, the problem with Klarna was that although they were very successful, got a lot of customers, their financials were terrible, right? And so they, as a company, were really struggling with the idea that they have, they're a high-touch consumer product. They have an enormous number of customer support people. That's all expensive, right? So, and the problem that Klarna was, was facing is that their, their financial was so bad that they were, no, they were run out of places that they could go raise money privately. So their only path was going public, but their financials were terrible. They could never go public. So they were stuck. They were, they were, they were, in, they were heading off the cliff, right? What happened is they did one simple AI. I bet my guess at this is that they didn't spend more than a million, two million dollars doing this AI. And it replaced 700 customer support people, which threw $40 million to the bottom line. Guess what? They're going public. Their financials, financials are such that. So I'm going to spin it. No, it's bespoke. I'll talk about that. For enterprise com companies, it, these are all bespoke tools. You, you're not going to get, it's not going to be some random startup out of Palo Alto that generates the tool to do this. You're going to have to, you're going to have to engage with a company to do, either do it in-house, which is hard to do, right? Or engage with a company, and certainly Nublock's not the only company that does this kind of thing, but a Nublock-like company, right? So. So I'm going to spin it a different way. You know, one way to spin it is like, oh, 700 people lost their jobs. I don't think that's the correct strategic view. The correct strategic view is Klarna got to survive. Not only did they survive, they're going to thrive. So they didn't lose 700 jobs. They probably produced 10,000 jobs because they survived, right? So that, I think, is the right way to do it. But what will get publicized is a Klarna or the next Klarna reduce staff by 700 jobs. That's what's going to get publicized. That's the incorrect lens. You get to survive. You get to grow. You go fight another day. So now, now I'm going to go through some, some real case studies. Um, so just getting it back down to the practice. Remember, there's only three applications. In all of AI, there's only three applications that you can do. Um, this one was from a, a very large semiconductor company. I'm very good friends with, with the CEO, so I was kind of, from the very start of this whole initiative, I was, I was very much involved in it. Uh, what they had is, so it's a semiconductor company that produces, God only knows how many SKUs. 
it's an enormous catalog of product that they do. Probably, the average car in the world probably has 10, 20, 30 of their parts is inside of the car, and that's true of every car in the world, right? Uh, every satellite in the world has parts from this company, et cetera. Problem is, it's highly technical parts, even though each part may only cost a dollar or two, they're highly technical parts, and they're part of a much larger system. So being able to get the correct data about those parts, pretty important, because otherwise you've got a, a big car, delay like a whole new line of cars can get delayed. So what was happening is that the customer would call up the sales rep at this company. The sales rep would get the question, and unless it was in the data sheet, the answer would be, I have no idea what the answer is. But don't worry, I'll get you the answer. No problem. So you'd fire off an email to the principal engineer. Answering that email, not the principal engineer's problem. It's not part of his job, right? So what's that principal engineer going to do? I'll get to it, right? So maybe a couple weeks later, he'll actually do the test, whatever, send back an answer. So now the, this brand new Ford model just got delayed. The revenue got delayed. The purchase story got delayed to the company. Everybody's unhappy, right? So what they did is they did a generative AI engine that what it got trained on is every stitch of information, technical information this company has, every bit of it. And they went live, and it was able to answer 80% of the questions first time, right off the bat. But every time it gets a question it doesn't know, it sends off, the system sends off an email to the principal engineer, but not just that question, but all the related questions to it. The principal engineer answers that, and the system uses that as training data. Right? So now the system, after having been implemented for, I think they've had it live for about nine months, it's up to 92% of all questions. Everybody's happy. Company gets the PO, car model doesn't get delayed, sales rep gets his commission, right? Everybody's happy in that. The, that entire system, now this is, a, this is a Fortune 200 company, that entire system cost them $2.2 million to do. The benefit to them, this is in the tens of millions. Okay, here's, here's another one, a little kind of, this is real estate. This is uh, one of the largest real estate developers in Mexico. Um, by the way, as a side thing, something that Rebecca said I'm going to amplify on because I think she's exactly correct. AI technology is being developed in the U.S. It's highly concentrated. AI implementation is happening outside the country. And the reason is because if in the US, if you're a public company, you have so much pressure to go do a strategic study with Bain or BCG or McKinsey, who, like the customer, knows how to spell AI, probably doesn't know a lot about the technology, but that's an automatic waste of however many millions of dollars in consulting fees. And at the end, and you're going to waste a year, maybe more, for a report that will have very pretty graphics. Okay? And what's going to happen at the end of that process? At the end of the process, the McKinsey guy says, I have the business card of a guy at Google. Here you go. And so Google receives that, that inquiry, and they say, great, okay, we're Google, don't worry, we got you, we're going to develop this. What does Google do? Google does, goes and signs a $50 million multi-year contract to go boil the ocean. Now, anybody in this room that's been around large-scale IT projects know the bigger the project, the more likelihood it's going to fail. At the $50 million level, 99% it's going to fail. That's boil the ocean problem, right? So the U.S. is actually, implementation-wise, is, is just stumbling all over itself. Whereas in, in Latin America, for us personally, uh, we see it in Mexico. Mexico is really taking off, has taken off incredibly strongly for us. It's a lot of family offices. The decision cycle is very concentrated. And as Rebecca pointed out, you typically have the next generation is somebody 
a son or a daughter that went to an MIT or Stanford, God forbid, a Harvard, and comes back wanting to make an impact on the company. And what is the most obvious place? You're going to say, Apa, esta ia, creo que va a resultar, porque no lo investigamos, right? So I do think that, that, that AI represents probably the single greatest opportunity for the global south to outpace the more developed countries. Because I think the, the idea that it's mostly business, family businesses, allows it to actually execute much faster. Which brings us back to this example. Eduardo Leaño and his brother Alvaro. Exactly the same scenario. A younger generation, a multi-billion dollar company doing real estate development. They do, they do, uh, uh, they, they do sh retail, they do commercial, they do large scale residential, et cetera. Huge company. Two guys own it, right? Eduardo and Alvaro, right? It's a very short decision cycle. And what they want to do is that they want the real estate process in any country is a really complicated contract thing, right? Enormously complicated contract thing. And they don't want to have to rely on expensive lawyers all the time to generate these agreements, right? So they simply want an expert system in Mexican contra real estate contract law so they can say, hey, this is a transition. This is what it looks like. Give me a contract. Boom, right? Essentially free, right? Same, same thing as the actual real estate sale, especially at the consumer level, residential level, is incredibly complicated. I mean, uh, we work with one startup company that's, that's doing um, an AI for real estate brokerages. And in the US, I think, I think the number is, there's 100 separate touch points between the buyer of that house and the brokerage, be it be it the survey, be it the the license search, be it be it the questions about the property or the or the inspection, whatever, hundred touch points. That requires an enormous number of back office people to implement. Why not just have the AI do the whole thing? Why not? Why can't this residential, this real estate place sales office be able to have just the salespeople? But everything else is really automated with AI, eliminated the entire back end process, or at least the, the, the assisting the back end process so you reduce the, the costs associated with it. Another example is uh, this is a customer service one. Actually, I gave this one ex already. This is a, uh, a major bus company, again in Mexico, that what they want, this was the one that came up with, I want American Express black card service for anyone, every one of our millions of customers. And then separately, they're doing a route optimization because they feel that for them, if they did a route, route optimization for, for, for AI, they feel that they can get a 2 to 3% reduction in fuel costs. Total game changer for them. Sounds like not a lot, 2 3%. I think they're going to do better than 2-3%, but for them, if they get 2-3%, totally changes the economics of running a bus company. Okay, um, this next one is one of our own startups that, that we own. Actually, we're about, we're just as close, don't jinx it, just as close to exiting this one. Uh, what they did is that they are, um, they are the principal way that CarMax and Carvana are able to acquire used cars, okay? So it, it's an AI that goes out and it hunts all possible places that somebody is selling his used car. It takes all that data in, and let's say, I don't, I don't know the numbers, but let, let's suppose at any given one time there's 500,000 used cars for sales in the United States. But the AI then, in, in phase one, the AI would do is say, of these 500,000 cars, these are the 5,000 most likely sales that we'll be able to, to get to. So it analyzes the sale in whatever condition. So then it gives what was 70 sales guys, it gives those 5,000 leads, go close them, right? That was phase one. Phase two is like, we don't need the sales guys to negotiate the deal. 
we'll have the AI directly negotiate the deal. So now what we have is instead of 70 sales guys, we have five people that oversee the negotiation and see if, in case something is going wrong in the negotiation to be able to acquire the car to then resell it back over to Carvana, right? So there was a case that went from 70 down to five, but the productivity went through the roof in terms of the actual volume of cars that this company was able to do. Um, here is, uh, here's uh, uh, the largest hospital group in the United States. And what they do, uh, what they do is that they, they um, have these iPhones that you scan in your badge at the beginning of a shift. You scan in your badge, and then it populates everything about your team, all your messages, everything about you is populated into an iPhone among a bank of iPhones. You pick that one up, that's the iPhone that you use during your shift. Okay? So they have at this point, tens of millions of messages of all of the various caregivers, transport, nurses, doctors, all, the, all that kind of, and so what they're able to do is have AI do both operational and sentiment analysis against those messages to be able to detect, is, is a nurse starting to burn out? I need to flag that, right? Or, boy, it's getting pretty close to that person needing a wheelchair for transport. Why, why, don't, we, why don't we start queuing up? Why don't we send a message to, to that nurse, say, time for transport? Yes, okay? So it, it handles both operationally, but also quality of care by actually doing the AI analysis on, on, on the interactions. Um, this was a case, this was, uh, this was actually with Toshiba. Uh, what Toshiba had is they had a complicated product and they had, God only knows how many bugs reported on the system. A pile of bugs that it would have taken them years to be able to fix all of them. So we did, is did an AI analysis to be able to look at what was actually what the bug report was. And based on looking at what the bug report was, be able to figure out which ones were duplicates. So it turned out it was 20 to 1, right? Because people use different ways of describing the same thing, right? Different words. So it reduced it down to a pile that they were able to digest instead of years to be able to fix the entire pile. They got it down to six months worth of work, which totally stream, streamlined their operations because uh, not only actually, not only did the system reduce the volume, but also knew who was the engineer in the organization that actually understood this. So it would direct the, the problem to the right engineer so they could address it directly. Uh, here is, uh, this is actually an AI version of Rebecca. So, so Rebecca, Rebecca was here, uh, just, there you are, <laughs> right in front of me. So I've been using this slide for a little while. Okay, it looks kind of like Rebecca. I fed in a, a few images of Rebecca and this is what it came back with. So here what we do is that we, we um, this is a startup that we own again. And what we did is we, had, we did license deals with Wiley and all the big academic book publishers so that all of their content is available to the system. So now a professor is able to uh, say, I have this class, this curriculum, and it has AI design the textbook for that. So it'll say, all right, for this class, I want chapter three from this textbook, chapter 27 from that textbook, and it'll compile a textbook and say, all right, you happy with this textbook? Yes, publish. And then it's available to, for, for his class, either, either in printed form, which nobody ever does, or an, an online form to the students so they can annotate to do all the normal kinds of stuff. However, it turned out that this has an even bigger application inside of corporates, which is actually wasn't the original use case at all. But what happens here is that every company has an enormous quantity of internal documents. HR, compliance, regulatory, there's so many documents that it's impossible for an employee to be able to keep track of how, how they stay in compliance with the norms of that company just because of the sheer volume of information. So now I can do a simple natural language que query Ask Jesus, what is our HR policy on vacations? 
and what it, AI will come back with a synthesized answer. Well, from this manual, this manual, this manual, you know, this is the synthesized policy, right? But generative AI has this hallucination problem. So maybe it got it wrong. So what it then does is it actually starts bringing up the actual blocks of text from the policy and constructs a pseudo policy synopsis by actually showing the, the exact quotes. So it turns out that that's a great application for internal, internal to large corporates, which was a direct derivative of the original academic book publishing idea. And you see here some examples like risk and assessment and treatment policy, information security, roles and responsibility. You know, there's, there's so many of these kinds of documents is, is, exist even in a, in a relatively small company. Uh, we're going to skip this one in the interest of time. So, okay, so th th this is just one way to do it. This happens to be our way to do it. This is not not even the gold standard. This is just a way to be able to do this stuff. It seems to work for us. So what we do is when we approach a large corporate, what we do is we go through a discovery phase. And with that discovery phase, it's, it's partially it's education, just teaching the C-suite and the departmental level heads. So there's some lingua franca between us about what AI can do, what it can't do, what are useful use cases, what aren't. Etc. And just kind of a, a nuts and bolts, purely tactical kind of explanation of AI. And then we do departmental by departmental interviews, where we give examples for your kind of department. These are the kind of typical agents that somebody would want to develop. And then at the end of that, we compile all that feedback, and we'll wind up with typically this 30 to 50 of these agents that could be developed, right? So we'll say, look. Of this list, we think that these five are some combination of high impact, low cost, and low risk to go implement. Start with one of these, which one would you like? And they'll typically pick one or two to do. Small, small projects, not boil the ocean, right? Small projects, bite-sized chunks. You do that one, you achieve success, move on to the next priority one, and the next priority, and then that's how you form your roadmap. So when we do select one, then we scope out the application. What we mean by scoping is we do the business requirements, the architect, technical architecture, then how much time and cost is going to be to develop that agent. And then obviously the last phase is that we go into an implementation phase. So those are the three phases that we do. Once again, other people can approach it different ways. Um, so, um, the objective here is to go through a transition from a traditional company to an AI-enabled one. And by AI-enabled would be this kind of this intermediate step where you've taken, you've developed probably five to 10 of these really, really fundamental agents that you need for, to, to improve productivity within the company. But the entire company doesn't run on AI. You just have individual assistants that you've developed until you eventually achieve AI at the core, in which all job functions have AI systems. And once you've achieved that, you start attaching the workflows between these various agents, so it winds up looking like an organic whole. So there was a very big clue in that description. You cannot do this with third-party software. So this is appropriate for a larger company to go do, because ultimately the goal is to become AI at the core. And that's not going to be some cobbled solution of a little startup from Palo Alto that does customer experience stuff and a little supply chain thing over here. You can't glue them together. AI, you cannot glue AI pieces together. So typically for a larger scale company, it's going to be some kind of bespoke system that gets developed. There's plenty of opportunity at the SMB level, the smaller companies, maybe $5, 10000000 million in size, to go purchase... Per package solutions, but not for a larger company, not for one that wants to become AI at the core. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'm gonna skip that. Okay, so Rebecca had a lot of slides around values and ethics and diversity, et cetera. I have exactly one, <laughs> this is my one. 
this is a really complex issue. I mean, various of you asked about, you know, uh, bias that's built into these things. This is a really, really complex issue and beyond the scope of this conversation. But what I will say is that Rebecca exactly nailed the topic because what she said is you start with corporate values. And then you train the AI, all the agents throughout the organization get trained in those values. So if you want it to act like, if you want to, if your values are customer first, customer is always right, et cetera, you will train those AIs to lean into customer first. If you want to train it in EBITDA at all costs, it will behave that way. Right? So it is up to you to be able to integrate the fine tuning that reflects your own values as an organization. And fine tuning is a, and having said that, you have to be careful about the values, right? Like for example, Google emphasized DEI as a company, okay? So they made it a fundamental in their values uh, to be DEI. And as a result, everybody has heard stories about the introduction of Gemini. It went so far DEI, there was no longer a useful tool, right? Give me a picture of George Washington, and he's an African American, right? It went too far in the, in the tuning that it wound up deviating from the truth. So it's a really tricky thing how you do the fine tuning, but it's important to get the fine tuning right. And again, a really complicated topic, right? All by itself, beyond the scope of this, this, this presentation. However, a second really important one in here, beyond the values reflection and then the, the, the elimination of bias in it, the third one, it's a cultural one that's important, is you have a decision to make about how you are going to handle the AI being integrated into your company. Companies that don't think strategically will wind up thinking, great, I can eliminate 20% of my staff, and therefore I'm going to have much better financials, and that's the way I'm going to compete. Tactically, that could be great. Strategically, never works. Never works, right? If instead they say, all right, now I'm going to have an opportunity to redeploy those, those talents in place, that, place to be able to generate innovation or improve quality, customer service or to make me a better company, I'm going to compete on that basis, right? Strategically, much better decision, right? So, the, but how you message that internally, like that semiconductor company that I told you about, <clears throat> The very first thing they did is they held an all-hands company meeting. It's a big company, right? I think 10, 20,000 employees. All hands. And the opening statement from CEOs, we are going to become AI at the core as a company. We're not going to eliminate any jobs, period. So now, cooperate. It's important for the company. Now you know we're not going to eliminate any jobs. Now I need every one of you. And as a result, that company culturally the, the implementation of AI agents in that company did not come top down. It came bottom up. Like, hey, in my department, I could really use an agent that did blah. That would really have a big impact. It came bottom up because they knew how to handle it culturally. So we're going to rattle through these. First of all, I think you got the idea. Generative AI, shiny new toy, awesome. Great at some stuff, terrible at other stuff. Narrow AI. Terrible at some stuff, awesome at other stuff. In general, narrow AI can do superhuman things, superhuman capabilities. We cannot possibly even be remotely close to what narrow AI can do, right? Generative AI, eh, it's more knowledgeable, but it's, not, it's subhuman capability, right? There's no, there's, GPT doesn't operate at the level of a human being. Probably never will, right? It's, it has a better knowledge base, right? Broader knowledge base, can speak Persian, right? But it's a combination of those two technologies that's important. Second thing is there is a fundamental shift toward this agent model. If you could develop like a summer camp for the, the patriarchs and matriarchs, the founding generation, 
to go and get distracted so that they're not undermining our decisions. You know, help them find something to do that's yeah. not the company that they would pay for. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and that has nothing to do with AI, but it's one of the challenges that we are facing now. The baby boom generation, the baby boomers, are having it, it is difficult for them to give up and allow the new generation to come because they, their life was simply about working. And retiring for them is tough because then what is it that I'm gonna do now if my life was only working? And that gets complicated because they see millennial kids and they see the new generations respecting and being very protective about work-life balance. And you get, for example, as, uh, as this uh, founder in a family council the other day said, uh, when we were entering the, the, the conference room, you have to tell my daughter that if she wants to be the CEO, this is not a job from eight to five. This takes longer. The daughter was entering the room and she said, you know what, that uh, I'm showing you with the results that it can be a eight to five job and I can go out with my kids or to uh, uh, play soccer and not be totally absent from their lives as you were from ours. Ah, ouch. But uh, so, so that is another element why stepping aside and allowing others to and trusting the transition is difficult because are they going to be committed enough to keep right. this going? Right. Well, I promise that that was my last question. Thank you so much, Alfredo. Sure. Armando, do you want to join us here so that we can spend the last few minutes with your questions and your concerns for this panel? I'm going to move over. Any questions for Alfredo, Armando, for me? So you guys feel like kings of the world yet? Go for it. It's a little bit different. Um, some of the things that you encounter in family business is your administration, um, your promotion, payments, those type of things. Um, you all were just talking about the AI using the tools to help you combat uh, certain things instead of just buying something for a lot of money. Uh, but who gives those type of training so that we know which tools we, we can buy and use? So I think that will help navigate what we have to do. Can you help me with that? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Stereo. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. To Rebecca's point earlier, this, this stuff is changing week by week, right? So every business has three possible choices. One is to go engage with one of the foundation model. If you're a big enough company, you have the option of engaging with one of the foundation model companies. Open AI, Google, um, Anthropic, Mistral, right? You have the option of doing, uh, generally speaking, that's an option only really open to the largest companies. OpenAI, for example, has a minimum engagement of $2 million per agent. So it gets expensive, right? Google is typically writing 50 million plus contracts. So that's, unless you're a very huge company, that's not an option. Second option is to work with a company like a new block, something similar to a new block, that's gonna offer consulting services to kind of help you navigate, either to develop bespoke or to help you nav navigate the hundreds of options that there are for these various offerings if you're a smaller business. And the third option you have is a, a straight up bespoke model and that, that long term, a pure, purely bespoke model, if you're a company of sufficient size, that strategically to me, obviously I have a prejudiced view, that strategically for me is the, the best AI at the core kind of path to select. So in any event, it, all of these things point to engaging with a, an appropriate third party has real domain expertise of what the options are and can help you advise through it. As long as not Bain, BCG, or McKinsey. <laughs> I think that your question also brings uh, to the fore remembering 
that there's a need for board development, not only in family businesses, in all sorts of instances. Those who are making decisions at the governance level, they have to invest time in educating themselves as to be able to understand these opportunities, the implications it has financially in terms of investments, what it could bring about, and that has to be understood, and that implies devoting time to it and money. It's, it's going to be a specialty third-party consultancy. Okay. And they certainly exist. It's, it's an emerging industry, right? Okay. Uh, they didn't exist 15 months ago. They, they're exist, starting to exist now. But, yeah, you're going to have to... It's going to be how some combination... It's going to be some combination of strategic consultant plus deep domain expertise in AI to know which options you have available to you to kind of help with the roadmap. But to start with... First step is to ask yourselves the question of, what do I want to get rid of? If I ask all of you, like think of your 40 hour a week, 50 hour a week, are there tasks during that week that you don't wanna do? Is it 40% of your week, 20% of your week? 100% of your week? So normally people say about half, 40%, half of the things that you do. Those tasks, Maybe there's already tools off the shelf that you can use to get rid of those. I'll tell you, for example, I had a meeting last week uh, with a team of about six people. As we're talking, AI was recording and transcribing our Zoom meeting and developing a to-do list for each one of us as we're speaking. Now, we actually ended up changing the whole focus of a conference we're organizing and uh, we asked AI, well, based on all of the conclusions expressed during this meeting, change the website. AI did it on the spot. So in you know, our timelines, that would have taken probably a few weeks to follow up, change the copy, actually code uh, to modify the website. That's an example of the improvement in productivity we can have already if you can first think of the specific tasks that you hate doing. Top of the list, expense reports, people hate doing them. Performance reviews, people hate doing them, you know? So like make a list of those, and there's a good chance that a off-the-shelf solution, a startup is developing that you can test and maybe offload some of your unwanted tasks. Having piggybacking off that example, the other day I was on a Zoom meeting that had more AI agents transcribing the meeting than there were human participants. So we did, for a moment, think about what if we all just hung up and let them go at it. <laughs> we should have. If only there were more conversation. We need more read AI digital twins. Then it would have been perfect. Any other questions? Personalization at scale. So there are times now when you try to, let's say, contact a phone company or some or Apple or something, you know, and there's not a human interface on the back end that will actually give you that proper personalized experience. How do you mitigate um, those situations? You know, because there are times I genuinely just want to talk to somebody who will actually get it at some point. You know, AI is not great. That's that's the well that's the core of the issue. The old chatbots, you spent half the time saying, "Give me an agent, give me an agent, give me an agent." Right now, with this new generative AI, it's going to be better than the agent. It is better than the agent. So you're you're going to wind up in a conversation like uh, when you're on the phone with a human. It's like, 
give me the AI, give me the AI, give me the AI, because it's going to have more deeper expertise. And quite frankly, it's going to have better, I hate to say this, but it's going to have better human interaction than a human being. In fact, that was an interesting study that was done at Stanford. There was this one company that created an AI doctor, okay? And they tried to measure at Stanford Medical, they tried to, to um, measure it across nine different ways of, of measuring the performance of the doctor. And they did a blind test, right? There were human doctors being compared to this agent. One of the parameters was bedside manner be able to interact in a human way with a patient that's going through a traumatic event. The single category that AI did the best was bedside manner, <coughs> right? It blew away the doctors in terms of being able to diagnose disease, et cetera, but you expected that. You expected it to do better. It did way better in human interaction. Any, we have time for one more last, last question. Hi, Gloria. <laughs> yes. Anybody? Look, we have a, one of the world most respected consultants in family business. We have one of the world most respected AI experts in the world. Anything you want to share on your own family business challenges? It's, it's, it's free. <laughs> well, well, you're already for free. What's next? After AI, what's next? Well, after AI is the the the. Uh, the ultimate goal for all this stuff is attaining AGI. And go read, I would encourage you all to go read a book called Singularity Event. Um, and the idea is that eventually we get to the point of having an AI that is at least human level intelligence, if not better. And as soon as you get to that, then the AI can improve on itself and be even smarter, and then that AI is going to improve on itself and get a, and it winds up going up exponentially until you're creating a super intelligence. That will be an interesting moment in time. Some people will, in 1982, when I was a Lisp programmer at Harvard, of all places, <laughs> that pains me. It was, it was, I had a dark period in my life. Um, that prediction was that we would achieve AGI within the same decade. Now, it, uh, my, my son is a PhD, PhD student in AI at Stanford right now. He will argue that every component technology that we need to achieve that AI moment, the singularity moment, is already there. But then again, he's 28 years old. He hasn't seen us make these same predictions for the last, oh, I don't know, since I had hair. <laughs> so we don't, who knows when we hit that moment. Thank you so much, Armando and Alfredo. Do you have one last question? Actually, that's a very common product. That's you know when I said the, the personalization at scale is one of the one of the first one people are into. A related one to that is marketing. So I think I saw I read some statistic that all marketing content generation today, sixty percent is already AI generated. Sixty percent today, right? So it is already your. A lot of people's social media accounts for a lot of these influencers, et cetera, it's already being generated automatically. Technology goes through cycles. Right now, we're at the phase of let's build one for every single application imaginable. Just like with e-commerce, e you know, you had every website for different types of pet products or, you know, shoes, and then it consolidated into the Amazons of the world. So that's going to happen as well with this assistance. In my opinion, there will be consolidation. But right now, we have a lot of different products out there that are promising to do what you expected. To wrap it up, I just want to finish with one concept. When we started the, the session, I promised you to talk about what happens to labor-intensive markets, places where we do have a lot of family businesses, where the culture of the cluster is to occupy 
uh, our processes with intensive labor. I believe that right now with AI becoming this uh, omnipresent force around the world, we will be facing quite a lot of social disruption. There, there can be places in which unemployment will grow. It's happening in Silicon Valley. We're losing jobs already to AI. So think about this frog leap approach. What Alfredo said today, there's something really unique about family businesses. They're slow to making the decision. Once the decision is made, things can go way <laughs> faster than in other types of corporations. That's an advantage. So make the decision fast. Then you can go into implementation and you can be actually on the advantage point uh, for this process as compared to other corporations. The second thing that you have as an asset is that you know people. I ask governments, if half of your country becomes unemployed overnight, do you know how to handle that? The US will say no. Argentina will say, oof, we have experience, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, but that's an asset. You know how to deal with people. Family businesses are about the families. It's about the people. So that's an asset in an era where we're going to have tremendous change, a lot of anxiety within the organizations, and that will mean that if you don't know how to create those cultures and value systems that provide the safety net for the people in your organizations, you will die. But family businesses know how to do that, and that's the asset. So I'll leave you with that. Any final remarks? You said it well. <laughs> All right. My, my, so, actually, my final remark is that while you were out of the room, I put up the normal four, four phases of hum humanity where you usually make what was like to be the, in the steam age. Half of them made the same joke. So they didn't even need you here. They made, they made the old guy joke. Uh -huh. So thank you for that, for substituting for Rebecca. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you.